The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. Devotion to a high ideal inspires men of all ages. Often from the humblest walk of life, a man will respond to some driving inner conviction, will see beyond the margin of the world in which he lives, will envision a future far better than his own. Such a man was Nathan Hale. Out of tradition and legend and the few facts known about him that have come down to us from the days of the American Revolution, we have woven his story, the story of a 21-year-old patriot for whom no sacrifice was too great in the struggle for American freedom. And now as an overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play one of the loveliest of our current melodies, I Have Eyes.
Our story of the patriot Nathan Hale begins on a May morning in the spring of 1775. Green valleys dotted with the spires of sleepy Connecticut towns are lighted by a dazzling sun. It's the season when the land is stirring with new life. But it's more than ever true this spring of 1775. For within the last month up in Concord, Massachusetts, the crackle of farmers' musketry burst in the faces of British colonial troops. Patriots were rising in the cause of American freedom. It's a spring charged with undercurrents of excitement. But in New London, Connecticut, life continues as yet unperturbed. In a classroom of the Union School, the languor of spring prevails. And like his pupils, the young schoolmaster dreams of the soft countryside. But there's work to be done, and handsome 20-year-old Nathan Hale wraps his ruler on his desk. All right, young masters. Suppose we have today's memory lesson, book 10 of Pope's Iliad. Uh, Master Prentice, are you prepared? Well, I... I... Excellent. Proceed. Yes, sir. Is there... Is there... Uh, a chief so greatly brave, uh, and uh, uh, his life to hazard. Instead of just telling Master Prentice, I think we'd all prefer to hear directly from you, Master Perry. <laughs> Master Perry? Uh, is there a chief so greatly brave, his life to hazard, and his country saved? Lives there a man who, who singly dares to go to yonder camp or see some straggling foe? Or favored by the night approach so near, their speech, their counsels, and designs to hear? What fame were his through all succeeding days, while Phoebus shines, or men have tongues to praise? Master Hale. Yes? It would be dangerous for a man to do that, wouldn't it? Dangerous to say the least. Death if he were captured by the enemy. He'd be a spy. Within the next two months, the sharp skirmishes of Lexington and Concord inflamed the hearts of men throughout the colonies. And on July 7th, Nathan Hale resigned from the Union School to become a captain in the newly formed 7th Connecticut Regiment of the Continental Army. His term of enlistment ended in December, he re-enlisted at once. And it was during this period when the new army was being organized that General Washington granted his officers leave to visit their homes. Nathan Hale went down to Coventry, Connecticut, to his father's house. The night was hushed in silence. Snow was falling as he opened the front door. Anybody home? Who is it? Alice! Nathan! But I can't believe it. Oh, Alice. It's almost... Oh, let me get my breath. Oh, it's good to see you again, Alice. Such a surprise. Wait till the family gets back. Where is everybody? At the meeting house. Nathan, tell me, what are you doing in Coventry? Well, first of all, I'm going to get warm. Oh, oh fire looks mighty good. Don't tell me you've left the army, Nathan. Oh, no. No, home on leave. Good. How long can you stay? Not more than a week, I'm afraid. Oh, well. There'll be more leaves coming. Then pretty soon it'll be over and... And you'll be home for good. <laughs> Optimistic, aren't you? Are things that bad? Sit down beside me, Alice. Is that better? Much. You tired? Not now. Alice. Yes? You're not wearing your wedding ring. Well, after all, I am a widow, Nathan. Everyone knows that. Guess I can't get used to it. I want to forget it, Nathan. My marriage was Mother's idea. But it was you and I who were in love. Oh, we were so young, Nathan. We still are, Alice. Do you think it could be like this between us? Always? Do you want that very much, Nathan? Yes, very much. Darling, I've never stopped loving you. We'll make our own lives from now on. Nobody will interfere. I've missed you, Alice. Missed you terribly. After this is over... Oh, darling... We'll have all our lives together. No matter what happens. Don't say that. Nothing will. I'll always love you, Alice. When his leave...
leave expired, Nathan Hale left the comfort of the Coventry Hearthside and Alice Adams, the girl he loved, to return to the army of General Washington. After the British evacuation of Boston, the Continental Army moved brigade after brigade to New York, where Lord Howe was gathering his powerful forces on Long Island to crush the colonial troops. Hale was now a captain in Colonel Knowlton's regiment, and no one more than he realized the perils that threatened the cause of American freedom. Accompanied by Knowlton, he answers a summons to headquarters from General Washington. Yes, come in. Sir, Captain Hale awaits your pleasure. Ask him to come in at once, Captain Hall. Yes, sir. Captain Hale reports his orders, sir. Captain Hale, Colonel Knowlton informs me that you and your company have been assigned to cover the north shoreline of Long Island Sound. Yes, sir. I'll come to the point at once. I need information. The safety of the whole army depends on it. You may be able to secure that information, Captain Hale. What is it you want to know, sir? Lord Howe's plans. I'll try, sir. It's asking a lot. But if we could only know two things. When will the British cross the East River from Long Island? And where will they attack? I understand, General Washington. I hate to suggest it, but you might go in disguise into the British lines as a spy. That means a grave risk. You know the consequences if you're caught. Yes, sir. I know. Be cautious, Captain Hale. You're young, you know, and you might give yourself away. I'll remember that, sir. Good. Now, you will get in touch with certain persons on Long Island who have been of service to us before. There's a shoemaker in Jamaica, Simon Carter. Simon Carter. Yes, sir. Use the word liberty twice in your first speech to him. That's the password. Carter may have some information. If he has, I'll get it to you. I'll do my best, General Washington. I know you will. Goodbye, Captain Hale. I hope we meet again. Thank you, sir. Good day. At dawn the following morning, Nathan Hale, accompanied by his friend Captain William Hull, set out for Connecticut, where they hoped to find some means of crossing the Sound to the north shore of Long Island. Near Norwalk, they learned that an American sloop was lying offshore. And then, dressed again as a schoolmaster in a brown homespun suit, Nathan Hale and his companion rose stealthily out to the ship under cover of darkness. After a few minutes, the dark shadow of the sloop towers above them in the night. Ahoy there! Ahoy. Stand by, I'll report you. William, as soon as I go aboard, row back to shore and wait a week for me. If I've not returned by then, go back and report me as lost. All right, Nathan. Good luck. Ahoy there. What's wanted? I wish to come aboard, sir. With your permission. Your voice sounds familiar. You don't by any chance happen to be Captain Hale. I am Captain Hale. But you have the advantage of me, sir. Don't you remember Captain Pond? I was in your regiment up in Boston. Pond! I'm glad to hear your voice. Come aboard. I'll lower a ladder for you. Thank you. Boston. Yeah. Goodbye, William. Lower a ladder. I'll right. try to be back in a week. Time. We'll be waiting, Nathan. William, look alive with that. if something goes wrong, you know what I mean, will you do something for me? Of course. Give my uniform to my family and, and tell Alice I'll be thinking of her right up to the last. All right, Nathan. I will. Come aboard, Captain Hale. Goodbye, Nathan. Goodbye. You are. Careful now. Give me a hand. Watch yourself. All right. There. Thank you. Captain Hale, I'd never have known you if I hadn't heard your voice. Look, Pond, will you take me to Long Island and land me in some out-of-the-way spot? Why, yes, if you wish it. Good. Can we go at once? Yes, sir. Boston. All right, sir. Get underway for Long Island. Bring her to in that cove near Huntington. You know the place. All right, sir. All hands on deck. How long have you the decided to be on Long Island, Captain Hale? Well, about a week, I think. Could you meet me at the same place you're going to leave me, say, a week from tonight? I'll send a small boat ashore for you soon after dark, a week from tonight. Good. I'll be there. Come on in. 
Is this the shop of Simon Carter, the shoemaker? It is no less. Are you at liberty today, uh, at liberty to do a little work for me? Close the door. Now, sir, I'll do what I can for you. Have you any information for General Washington? Aye, plenty. Can you give it to me? It's all written out in these notes here. Careful. Good. Give it to me. Just a minute. Don't them boots of yours need new soles? Why? Listen, I'll hide these notes in the soles of your boots. See? That's an excellent idea. It's the thing you've ever seen. It's my own idea. I wonder if you could hide some notes I've taken myself in the same way. Of course I could. I resole both your boots. Give me your notes. Here. What kind of writing is this? It's Latin. Oh. I thought that they were discovered on me. Well, I'll put it where they'll never find it. Yeah, right in this sole. Now sit down there and pull your boots off. I'll fix them up for you. Good. I'd better hide. No, it's better you sit right there in the dark corner. You look innocent enough. Come in. Morning, Sam. Ah, good morning to you, Lieutenant Drew. I got your boots all finished for you. All right. Hard at work, I see. You're always hard at work, Lieutenant. Well, here are your boots. I'll wrap them up for you. Who's that gentleman over there? A uh, customer. I'm fixing his boots. Know him? Never set eyes on him before. I guess I'm much mistaken. I've seen him before, but I can't place him. Well, here's your boots, Lieutenant. Hey, come around again when you have need of a good shoemaker. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Haven't we met somewhere? I think you're mistaken, Mr. Drew. Drew, Lieutenant of His Majesty's Navy. Are you a stranger hereabouts? Yes, I am. Do you live on the island? Yes. Yes, I do. Where, may I ask? Near Huntington. Oh, yes. Well, no doubt I've seen you over there. I'm often at Huntington. Perhaps you know that delightfully charming lady who keeps the tavern, Mrs. Chichester? Uh, uh, slightly. Only slightly. <laughs> you should know her. <laughs> delightful soul. Well, good day, sir. Good day, Simon. Good day, Lieutenant. Seen that man somewhere, but I can't place him. Well, as long as he can't place you, you're safe. Just leave the neighborhood as soon as I fix your boots. Yes, I think it would be best. In Huntington, a few days later, the widow Chichester was bustling about her tavern kitchen when Lieutenant Drew entered the back door. Good evening, Mrs. Chichester. Good evening to you, Lieutenant Drew. What are you doing coming into my kitchen, I'd like to know? Open the door to the tap room just a little. Very well. Mrs. Chichester, do you see that man sitting alone in the corner? The nice-looking young fellow in the brown suit? Yes, that's the one. Do you know him? Never set eyes on him before. Then he's not from Huntington. He is not. I know every young blood hereabouts, and he's not a native here. I can warrant you that. Close the door. I have it. He's a rebel. A, a rebel indeed in my cabin? I'll go throw him out. No, 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 no. We must make certain first. But I think he's an officer in the rebel army. Some months ago, I was captured near Boston. I escaped later. But while I was a prisoner, I saw this fellow, unless I'm much mistaken. I saw him again the other day in Jamaica, at the shoemaker's. Here, look at him. Through this crack in the door. He's looking for something out the window. He's watching the shore of the cove. Looking for a boat to fetch him away, I'll warrant you. Exactly. Now, Mrs. Chichester, let's set a trap for him. I will, that. A rebel and like is not a spy in my tavern. You go into him, begin to talk to him, and then look out of the window. Uh, so you've just seen a small boat landing. Aye, I'll do it. If he starts up, I'll know he's my man. And then? Well, tell him you're mistaken. The darkness fooled you. Yes. A small boat from my ship is waiting for me around the point. I'll bring it into the cove with my crew, and we'll apprehend him. That's the way. Now, wait here. I'll go in now. Good. Good evening, sir. How do you, sir? I hope, sir, you found the roast beef to your liking. Uh, yes. Yes, thank you, madam. Can I help you to anything else, sir? I think not, thank you. I'm sorry we have such poor fare, sir, but the times are hard. I've fared very well, madam. Oh, you're a lucky young man, then. <laughs> Look. Now, who can that be? What is it? Out in the cove there. A boat's coming in. Uh, uh, bring me the score, madam. I'd have sworn I saw a boat out there. Something must be wrong with my eyes. Well, bring me the score, madam, if you please. But, sir, you've had no sweetmeats. Now, come, sit down. I'll fetch you some. But, all right, madam. Bring the sweetmeats. I'll wait. A 
short time later, Nathan Hale leaves the widow Chichester's tavern and walks down to the shore of the cove to wait the boat he expects. Ahoy! Ahoy, Pond! Here I am! Right here! Then fast! Put your hands up! What? What's the meaning of this? It means that you're my prisoner. Seize him, men. I'm a schoolmaster. We'll soon see. Strike a light. Search him. All right, sir. Well, sir, I thought I'd seen you before. No, I know I have. You're an officer in the rebel army. I tell you, sir, I am a schoolmaster. Find anything in his pocket? Not a thing, sir. Rip his jacket to pieces. Look in the lining and the seams. Yes. Well, anything there? Not a thing, sir. Strip him, tear every piece of clothing to pieces. Yes, sir. Oh. It's a piece of paper. Let me see it. Hmm, receipt for lodgings. Is that the best you can do? It's all there is, sir. Perhaps now that you have ruined my clothes, you'll let me go. I will not. I'll find where you've hidden your notes if I have to rip your skin off. What about his boots, men? There's nothing in them, sir. I know. He was having them resold the other day. Give me a knife, Boston. He ought to. Ah, I thought so. Papers, papers, I thought as much. Bring the light nearer. Well, what's this, Latin? <laughs> Who would have expected a rebel to know Latin? I am a schoolmaster. Sir. Aye, and a spy as well. My Latin's a little rusty, but I can make out the tenor. Hmm, disposition of troops. Probable movement of army. What have you to say to this? Nothing. You don't need to. We have evidence enough to hang you as it is. Bring him along, men. That night, Nathan Hale was brought before Lord Howe, whose headquarters were in the Beekman House at Mount Pleasant. Confronted with the overwhelming evidence, the young captain confessed that he was a spy, and curtly without the formality of a trial, Lord Howe turned him over to the Provo Marshal William Cunningham for execution in the morning. After spending the night under guard in a greenhouse on the Beekman estate, Nathan Hale was taken shortly before 11 o'clock the next morning to the tent of Captain John Montressa, an aide-de-camp of Lord Howe. The tent was in an apple orchard, and outside, Hale knew the British soldiers were setting up a ladder and tying a rope to the limb of a tree. I'd hurry and finish those letters if I were you, Captain Hale. I don't think the Provost Marshal would approve, but then he always objects to everything. I've asked the corporal to warn us. Thank you for this courtesy, Captain Montressor. You're very kind. The oh, marshal is coming, Captain. Thank you, Corporal. By whose authority is the prisoner writing at that table? I took the liberty, Marshal. It seemed the least we could do for the boy was to let him write a few letters. I'd have to read them before they set out of our lines. Very well, Marshal. Everything's ready. That apple tree out there will do. One's as good as another to hang a rebel on. Captain Hale hasn't quite finished his letters, Marshal. Let you belong. He's written enough. I'm sorry, Captain. Of course. I'll come. Will you please see that these letters are delivered, Captain? Especially this one to Mistress Alice Adams. Very well, Captain Hale. Is there anything you wish now? Could I see a clergyman? Absolutely not. May I have a Bible? You may not. But, Marshal... I'm in command here. I'll have no foolishness. Guard, we're ready. All in around the prisoner. Just a minute. Captain Montresor, I'll trouble you for the prisoner's letters. But I promise... I promise. Hand them over. It's all right, Captain. Now, what do you think of this rebel? Marshal, you have no right. Silence, sir. You're under my orders. I'm sorry, Captain Hale. You've heard enough from you, Marshal, sir. If the prisoner has any last words to say, he can say them to me. I only regret I have but one life to lose for my country. Come, we waste time. Quick step, march! Goodbye, Captain Hale. Goodbye. All right, Captain Hale. Mount the ladder. Is there a chief so greatly brave, his life to hazard and his country save? Lives there a man who singly dares to go to yonder camp or seize some straggling foe? Or favored by the night approach so near, their speech, their counsels, and designs to hear? What fame were his through all succeeding days? 
while Phoebus shines or men have tongues to praise. o'clock on the morning of September 22nd, 1776, Nathan Hale sacrificed his young life for the cause of American freedom. That was his ideal, and there is none finer in the cavalcade of America. has a message for you from the company which makes these programs possible. This week, 76,535 people will receive a report from the president of the DuPont Company. Those thousands of people scattered from Maine to California, from Washington to Florida, are the stockholders who own the DuPont business. President Lamont DuPont has some interesting facts to tell them in his annual report. Facts also of interest to every American citizen. For example, the problem of employment for workers throughout the nation. The DuPont Company has found that its policy of continually developing new and better products through scientific research and invention, coupled with the courageous investment of venture capital, leads directly to greater opportunities for work in its plants. Yes, venture capital, well named, because new enterprises always involve risks. In this connection, it is estimated that in the DuPont Company, an average investment of approximately eleven to twelve thousand dollars is required to provide work for one man. For many years, DuPont's practice of this expansion policy has produced healthy growth and new jobs. It is believed, therefore, that if the nation's unemployment problem is to be solved, new industries must be established. And equally important, changes must be made in old industries so as to reduce waste, decrease costs, and give the consumer more for his money. Billions of dollars worth of worn out or out of date equipment must be replaced with efficient tools of production. That job would put millions of unemployed to work. During 1938, DuPont spent approximately $21 million in the extension and improvement of manufacturing facilities. These millions of dollars, courageously spent, found their way into countless pay envelopes and thence moved across counters into store cash registers. From there, into the pockets of farmers and factory workers, marched on to do good wherever they went. Such is the history of business progress in America. The investment of venture capital has always been essential, and DuPont plans to continue its expansion policy in 1939 and the years to come, a policy completely in keeping with the spirit and meaning of the DuPont pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. week, the Cavalcade of America will present an unusual story of the famous American detective Alan Pinkerton and the dramatic role he played in the life of Abraham Lincoln. So until next week, then, at the same time, this is Thomas Chalmers saying good night and best wishes from DuPont. Columbia Broadcasting System.